from the uh, Acts of the Apostles. Who was I, said Peter, to think that I should stand in God's way? And when they heard these things, they fell silent. They glorified God. They fell silent. But somebody snapped out of it and said, well then, so God has given the Gentiles too the repentance that leads to life. That is the shorter gospel, right? Repent and believe the good news. So God has turned them around too. It has happened. And they fell silent. I'm sure you have all been in moments of unexpected silence in which, far from being simply an absence of speaking, the silence was loaded with nearly thundering significance. The Greek word in this passage conveys not merely silence, as if to say, okay, I've lost this argument, I'll stop now, but it conveys something more like speechlessness. <coughs> a silence brought on when some, some wise instinct simply leads us to stop talking already, stop jabbering, because we just had the wind knocked out of us. I thought of the Queen of Sheba visiting King Solomon. She, with all her retinue, her rich and exotic gifts, her apes and her ivories, and her peacocks. And yet, when the Queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, this is the description in Kings, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of all his servants, their rich clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings, all of them, hundreds, that he offered at the house of the Lord, it says, there was no more breath in her. I thought also of the revelation to John, a snippet from a different part of what Lee just read. The lamb possesses a book in chapter 6. The lamb possesses a book that has seven seals. The seals are being broken open one by one, and after each seal is broken open, a judgment happens on the earth. There are the four war horses. And their riders, we hear the noise of trumpets, bowls of destruction are pouring out upon the earth. And then, sudden stillness, quiet, Ooh, thank you, sudden stillness for half an hour, whatever half an hour means in heaven. But there is something about this seventh seal that stops every mouth and silences all of heaven. It feels like God is passing very near. One prophet wrote, be, be silent all flesh before the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. <clears throat> I hope you can tell that I absolutely love that the early church stood in a long moment of silence as this breathtaking truth of the whole matter came dawning upon them. For they now know, don't they, that something very close and very precious to them is about to be dismantled, something we will see the early church continuing to agonize over in the days and years to come as Paul battles his opponents about who is and who is not circumcised, and as they argue about eating clean and unclean food, all laid out in the, uh, books of, in the book of Acts and other books, now that last week and this week, we at morning prayer were reading all through the book of Exodus. It's a long one. Morning prayer, 9 a.m. every weekday, easily accessible from the parish website. <laughs> reading that book, undeniably, there was a time when we believed that God was our own private tribal God. And I loved listening to a discussion at morning prayer about, have we really gotten over our nearsightedness about God as ours? Does God care chiefly for our tribe still? Or as we hear God chiding, chiding us in Amos, the other prophet, as Amos cries out, I reject your altars you have built to other gods 
while you trample on the needy and you bring to ruin the poor of your land. Ugh, are you not, are you not the same as the Ethiopians to me, O oh Israel, when you get right down to it? Yes, I brought you up out of Egypt. I also brought up the Philistines from their lands. And I brought the Aramaeans from their lands. The apostles and the believers came to, challenge, came to Jerusalem specifically to challenge Peter for eating with people who are not us. And isn't this the old, old question that's asked? Why eateth your master with sinners? Or as wise chaplain Montague, I've said this before, would regularly be asked, why do you give your holiest things to the worst people? The early church had to give up an ancient idea that mixing Jew with Gentile would turn the covenant upside down and cause them to be cut off from God and cast away from the promises. You recall the covenant when Yahweh God had said, I will be their people and they will be. That's precisely backwards. They will be my people and I will be their God. And they were to be a holy priesthood, all right. But remember, all the other nations are in this story too. The holy priesthood is to raise up all the other nations before Yahweh God. Don't leave out the other nations from the covenant. They are going to be blessed under the very same covenant. Now the book of Acts is somewhat, more than somewhat, about the early church slowly learning that they are now being called to give up the defining features of their nationhood. The uncircumcised Gentiles are being given the good news of new life in Jesus. The Gentiles who are now joining, they're not observing the kosher food laws. The Jewish church will realize things about themselves too. As devoted as they are now, fully devoted to Sunday as the Lord's Day, when they worship in people's houses and uh, they have the fellowship there, the breaking of bread and the prayers, while they are still gathering in synagogues for the Saturday Sabbath. Yes, the early church did both. There is a scene in the Grapes of Wrath when the, when the folks are leaving Kentucky and they're loading up their truck, and they can't take most of what they, of what they want to take. And the, they ask the, the question of themselves, but how, how will we know it's us if we don't have these things? How will we know it's us without our stuff? <laughs> you laugh, don't you? No wonder that there was a long moment of, I'll, I'll just say, surprised silence. And we, here in the 21st century, what are we clinging to, clinging to? What would give us that long moment of pause? Don't we still argue, for example, don't we still argue about who is an American? As they did in the days following the American Revolution, when the founders worried that committees of scheming Englishmen might cross the sea, might run one of them for president, and thus from within, might work to return our country to King George III. The founders considered it, and they dealt with that danger right away. They couldn't solve it by saying, hmm, only a, a, an American is qualified for the president uh, if he speaks English. No, that was not going to work, because there were far too, at that time, there were far too many who spoke only German and Dutch in this country. Plus, the English themselves, our late enemy, well, they certainly all spoke English, didn't they? <laughs> no. At that time, they came, they, they defined an American citizen simply as a free white person who had been born in the United States. It became more complicated later, but that was their first position. Later acts of Congress, of course, are going to include people who were in the territories we captured during the Mexican War, for example. And ultimately, as you know, the 14th Amendment anyone born in the United States or its territories, et cetera, et cetera. Now back to the early church. Before people even thought to call us Christians, things were not static in the Jerusalem of the 40s, the year, the 40s, the 50s. The Jews were already preparing for violent rebellion 
with all of the anxiety that that always brings about who is and who belongs to our side and who is fraternizing a little too much with the enemy and, and who can be trusted once the shoot, all of that was there. Who belongs to our side? Now to welcome the Gentiles into the community of Israel must have felt at first like they were fraternizing with their enemies. And yet, immediately before the scene that Lee read, immediately before these apostles confronted Peter, he had just come from Caesarea witnessing to the family of the Gentile centurion, whose name was Cornelius. Peter, a Jew, we just heard him insist that he had never allowed anything ritually unclean to pass the gate of his lips. Now he says, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every age, anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to him. God has no favorites, in other words. Now, it doesn't mean that God runs the world like a democracy. And of course, it can't mean, it cannot mean that God thinks all of our opinions are equally valid or that all of our actions are equally okay with him. But it, it does mean, it does mean there are no ethnic barriers. And I'm going to add, there are no moral barriers to anyone who wants to turn around again and return. None of those old barriers that prevented everyone. Okay, the doors are open to anyone who comes, being offered forgiveness and new life in this world. Yes, in this world, they're being offered life, and I mean not, not um, life after death, as people often speak of it, but uh, as Christians think of it, life eternal, in fact, not waiting for it until after we die, but offered this very morning even as we prepare ourselves to approach our friend and savior in the Holy Communion. Amen. Amen.